smart and innovative solution programs, such as sharing knowledge sessions with experts and representatives from AIS participating countries, Plankton, which was a competition to raise awareness in reducing marine plastic debris, Impact Pitching, which connects startups, small and medium-sized enterprises, potential investors, and growth enablers to gain partnership, and Ending Plastic Pollution Innovation Challenge, which was a collaboration with Marine Plastic Debris Project, UNDP Indonesia, to address marine plastic pollution in Southeast Asia. Many solutions to challenges that affect AIS participating countries in four main thematic areas and SDG 14 goals are produced through collaboration programs. These programs will explore opportunities through innovation and experiment that benefits on a local, regional, and international scale through sharing knowledge and experiences between AIS participating countries. The archipelago of the States Bulavnaka, everyone. Good evening and good morning to everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Susanna Vulawalu, and I'm very pleased to be a moderator this evening. And I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the AIS Forum and say a big thank you for your time and your interest in today's session. Uh, we have an amazing panel this evening uh, who will be sharing their expert opinion on our topic, which is uh, sustainable fisheries in the Pacific, the lessons learned. I will introduce the speakers in more detail uh, just before they present. But for now, we have um, Ms. Nemeling Garrara, Mr. Rufi Navarrea, and Mr. Peter Rouge. Thank you all so much to our speakers for being here this evening. Uh, just before we begin, I'm going to quickly go through today's um, format. This is how the next hour and a half is going to go. Right after, uh, right after this, I'm going to welcome His Excellency, the Fijian Ambassador to Indonesia. Mr. Amenatave Vaksavuanga Yovoli, who's going to say a few words. And after that, we will hear from our speakers. Our speakers will have 15 minutes each to present or share their work, and they are free to choose the format. And uh, we would love to hear from you when the presenters are, when the speakers are presenting. So please uh, feel free to ask any questions or make any comments that you have. And you can do that by typing in your questions in the question box and in the control panel. Now there's a very good chance we won't be able to ask your question in the 15 minutes. So I ask that you please attach the name of the presenter that you would like the question um, directed to. So um, I hope that we will enjoy today's session. And uh, with that, I'd like to give the screen to His Excellency, Mr. Amenatave Ovoli. Bulevinaka, sir. Bulevinaka, moderator. Salamat malam. Fiji and the South Pacific, here in Indonesia, good afternoon. Uh, and uh, let me thank you sincerely for organizing this very, very pivotal and uh, useful uh, forum for exchanging of such an important uh, uh, concept or resources in our region, and the FIB sustainable fisheries in the Pacific. Uh, it would be a remiss on my part not to thank uh, Mr. Akmal Sani, the coordinator of the IS Forum Secretariat, for inviting me to provide a few words as a scene setter. Uh, hopefully, it can provide some scene setter which you can break further. Uh, in fact, within uh, these uh, two days, uh, uh, Madam Moderator, this is the second uh, forum that I have participated in both linking to our resource, uh, natural, uh, 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 our efficient management and utilization of our natural resources. Uh, yesterday, I opened, uh, on, uh, I opened a workshop on uh, um, the importance of uh, vegetable gardening. But the countries that attended came all the way from Lebanon, all the way to Fiji. So you could see the interest in terms of our resource sectors, 
particularly guided by the, the global uh, sustainable development goals for countries to be able to take ownership and know their destiny as we go forward. So uh, when I was given this task, I said, okay, let, let, let me have another go at that. I, I think these two are, are related and I can be able you know, to, 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 uh, to link the two. I noted that I have only 10 minutes and I will, I will be abided by that. Um, if I don't, please uh, ring your bell. Uh, the topic uh, this afternoon is, is quite uh, apt. It's quite uh, pivotal. And uh, while it is broad, uh, because we're looking at the entire Pacific region, uh, I would like to focus on, on Fiji and the lessons that we learn so that we can be able to share this uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the panel as well as uh, with the participants uh, throughout uh, this afternoon's um, uh, discussions. So, uh, <clears throat> Let me just uh, quickly dive into my presentation. Uh, I just have notes, sorry, I don't have PowerPoint uh, presentations. Um, with some background issues, so just for your noting, like any other Pacific Islands, TG values the importance of our fisheries resources for many reasons, and we all know the reasons. Let me just reiterate some reasons here. Our forefathers have reserved our shared fisheries resources and with their knowledge and passion, and we have benefited from their sustainable practices in the past. I think this is something that we are learning from this current day and age. The question is for us, how can we continue that sustainable uh, practices of fishing uh, in, into the future? Because it's the future generation who will, be, who will bear the brunt of, uh, of our malpractices. Fisheries resources have not only provided for our sustenance, but it is weaved within our culture and tradition. That is why I, among other individuals within the Pacific, Pacific region, am passionate when it comes to our ocean and its fisheries uh, resources. <clears throat> Which is fortunate that our leaders have always been at the forefront when it comes to environmental progress and sustainability. Uh, we have been active at the global and regional platforms, and we see it as a fitting medium to voice Fiji's sustainable priorities. You might have seen in a, not, not too long ago, Fiji was leading role at the UN Oceans Conference in 2017, firmly taking a leadership role in this area. And our presidency at COP23 are fitting examples of how we determine uh, as a nation to voice the importance of sustainability. The key here is sustainability. Like, like, like in, in, in any other sectors, it's always important that the word sustainability is embedded in our policy, um, uh, policy formulations, because failing which, it'll be a disaster going forward. For fisheries, this goal has transpired in our active participation with regional fisheries management organizations, or RFMO, and other platforms such as the Forum for the Archipelagic Island States, the forum that is organizing our, that is bringing us together this wonderful evening. As a case study for Fiji, with that background issues, let me just say, uh, uh, share a few important points. At national level, Fiji has incorporated sustainable goals within our national policies and framework. Our national ocean policy has the vision to provide for a healthy ocean that sustains the livelihoods and aspirations of current and future generations of Fiji. The mission is to secure and sustainably manage all of Fiji's oceans and marine resources. Sustainably, the key, you can see that the word sustainably is there. This is further filtered through operational plans under the relevant ministries and agencies to ensure that Fiji plays its role in ensuring the sustainability of fisheries resources in the region. The following is thematic or lessons learned. I, I, I wanna share also with you. Uh, I have a list, so let me start with one. Having the supporting legislation 
and policy framework. As all of you may have known, I've been in the civil service you know, for almost 30 years now, without a very robust policy supported by enabling legislations as to provide the necessary conditions, it will be difficult. It will be a challenge uh, to move forward. So legislation and policies consider the backbone. Fiji considers the backbone for sustainable measures that are introduced within the context of fisheries. This helps relevant ministries such as fisheries to undertake specific activities related to gathering the needed science, setting up of catch limits and undertaking enforcement and compliance activities to name a few. Two, importance of science to aid decision-making. We really have to be guided by science. Most of the time, I think we tend to ignore the very essence, the very life and blood of our decision-making process. And science is important. Science-based decision is important in sustainable fisheries as it helps decision makers make informed decisions based on the status of fish stocks. Third, a holistic approach. Sustainability is about everyone's participation in the inclusion of all stakeholders in the formulation of management decisions. Since our resources are co-shared, it is pinnacle to include all stakeholders in discussions on sustainable matters. That is very, very key for us. This includes resource owners, the private and public sector and civil society uh, brought together. Fourthly, the precautionary approach. In the absence of science, the precautionary approach is key to ensure control over exploitation of resources. Fiji has been able to implement such an approach in its declaration of ban on the harvest and sale of sea cucumber. Five, equipped with the relevant manpower, a challenge, a tall challenge for us in, in the region, in the South Pacific region. The, <clears throat> since the ocean and its resources cover a wide area, it is imperative that legislation and policies are supported by a sizable workforce. Our experience indicates that with the right amount of workforce, targets are achieved and there is effective progress in sustainable fisheries management. Sixth, and lastly, have the relevant financial support. Financial support is important in the implementation of any sustainable measure. This is across the whole spectrum of sustainable fisheries management, whether it is an area of research and technology, development of marine protected areas, policy and legislation formulation, enforcement and compliance is uh, topical to name a few. Over the past years, Fiji continues to adapt to new management measures to help boost sustainability of our fisheries resources. As I'm coming uh, uh, closer to my, my end of, of my remarks, let me just try and link it to our Fiji and the SDGs, uh, bring it back to, to the global level. Through Fiji's continuous commitment, we are certain that our progress is geared towards achievement of the broader goals of sustainable development or the 2030s sustainable development goals. By implementing an improved approach to sustainable fisheries management, Fiji does not only address SDG 13, which is climate change, and 14, which is oceans or below water, but a handful of other sustainable development goals that can be included and under this approach by Fiji. Um, for example, goal number one, SDG one, no poverty. Goal number two, zero hunger. Goal number three, good health and well-being. Goal number five, gender equality. Goal number eight, decent work and economic. Uh, and goal number 12, responsible consumption and production to name a few. Uh, Madam moderator, to conclude, uh, let me say that Fiji will continue to remain committed to play its part in the important work of sustainable fisheries. We are determined to continue to build partnership with our regional family 
in addition to other nations that share the same goals with us. We strongly believe that everyone has a part to play in ensuring the survival of our fisheries resources. We have inherited our, our fisheries resources from our forefathers and we owe it to them to ensure that our future generation inherits the same. Through partnership, cooperation and dedication, we will also be able to sustain, manage and protect our shared resources. Let me thank the partnership with the AIS and UNDP uh, Indonesia and the government of, uh, of Indonesia with this important collaboration, engaging our, our parties to the, to the to the AIS group. And I really would like to thank them for organizing this meeting. Terima kasih banyak, Nagabolebu, Roma, back home, Naka. Nagabolebu, sir. Nagabolebu, indeed, I, I totally agree with your um, uh, words. You know, within the bleak picture of global fisheries, the, the Pacific Island is relatively better off than other regions in the world, right? Because development started um, much comparatively later than in other regions. You know, however, we have issues and methods to consider in this in um, the situation because it is rapidly evolving and there is a strong risk that our status will deteriorate in the near future if governance and management is not improved, right? So, but however you look at it, fisheries in the Pacific is critical to our revenue, our development, jobs, it's a food source, our traditions, and even our identity. And to be able to balance all these considerations is exactly what sustainability is about and is exactly what we hope to talk about this evening with our speakers. Thank you very much, sir. Um, let's um, go down straight to the to our next uh, and the first uh, presenter. All right. Um, I'm very excited to welcome our um, first uh, speaker this evening. But right before that, I just want to say a few more things, just in case you're joining us. We have 15 minutes for each uh, speaker to present. We have three speakers this evening, and we would love to hear from you. So please. Uh, write down any questions or comments that you have in the question box in the um, in the control uh, section. And we have some announcement for you if you're on uh, joining us on Zoom that we would like you to adhere to. So let me introduce to you our um, first speaker this evening. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Ms. Nemlinga Rara. She is joining us from the Solomon Islands. She is a marine scientist and a researcher she has a master's degree in marine science from the University of the South Pacific with a background in environmental geoscience and resource management. Today, Ms. Nemely will be sharing with us her expert opinion on what she has learned about the role of traditional knowledge in sustainable fisheries. And with that, I ask us to turn our full attention to Ms. Nemely Ngarara. Nemely. Hi, Nemli. Can you hear me? I think your microphone is still off, uh, Nemli. Hello? Yep. Good. You can hear me clearly, right? Yes, perfect. Your, your video is still off though. Sorry, everyone. Let's just uh, give Nemli some time to get set up. I think she's having some difficulty with her connection. We apologize.
Okay, I think we'll uh, move on to our next speaker. And uh, Namely, is it okay if we come back to you after Rufino? Yeah, we'll just give you some time to get the um, setup going. All right, let me introduce you to our next speaker. Let's um, please welcome Mr. Rufino Varea. Rufino is a researcher and a PhD candidate at the University of the South Pacific. His background is in marine pollution, specifically in the field of um, ecotoxicology. This evening, Rufino will be sharing with us his opinion on the steps being taken to address the lessons learned from sustainable fisheries in the Pacific, in the lands of the Blue Pacific. His talk will provide us with information that will enable us to think about the direction that Pacific Island countries like Fiji are headed towards. And with that, I ask you to welcome onto your screen, Mr. Rufino Varea. Over to you, Fino. Thank you, uh, Susanna, and uh, hello to everyone who is uh, listening in. So, um, as uh, mentioned, I am a uh, I am currently pursuing a PhD in marine science at the University of the South Pacific, with a particular interest in marine pollution, and uh, I look at how certain types of pollutants pose health risks and biological stressors on marine animals uh, that are commonly, common seafood fish and shellfish, uh, which are consumed uh, in coastal communities in Fiji. And I thank the facilitators for considering me to uh, speak on this topic. So sustainability is, is a concept that is all too familiar for many of you. And it's something that is thought of from an economics perspective where the catch is at a maintained level to ensure fishes population productivity, which is usually a function of growth rate, reproduction, uh, and natural mortality. And, and this is all to enable a viable uh, level of different fish stocks into the future. Uh, and in the Pacific, the main indication of uh, sustainable fisheries uh, is its um, is its proportion of GDP in the Pacific Islands. And um, we use, uh, they're using this as an indicator to measure an increase in the economic benefits uh, to small island developing states from the sustainable use of marine resources. Uh, and this includes the sustainable management of fisheries and aquaculture by 2030. And uh, there are always trade-offs in the management of things. And uh, they can differ with, uh, you know, different countries or different regions. But fisheries as an industry, it's not limited to the harvesting of wild fish in our oceans or our rivers, but it also includes the um, includes aquaculture, uh, where different fishes and shellfishes are reared or cultured for harvest or, or sale or consumption. And this is a management solution as an alternative to harvesting wild animal stock. And one of the things we should remember is that, you know, while sustainable, uh, sustainable fisheries has an encompassing definition that's dedicated to fish populations and their viability, the management, the management of things has very little to do with fish and a lot to do with people and their practices like the tools that they employ, the types of nets they use, because it's the people who are ultimately harvesting these resources. And we want to ensure that it's done on a sustainable level, hence the emphasis on sustainable fisheries. And you know, there are a lot of lessons that scientists and economists have learned over the years. Uh, but I don't want to get into all of that, all of those lessons because there's a lot to unpack there. For example, was it worth pursuing down the highly industrialized and ambitious fisheries path to get to the state we are in now? Or are, we, are these lessons that we have learned worth it? Or who were the lessons for? Or what, what are we doing to address those lessons? And will it be enough? And, and I don't think that the panel is here to address that, uh, nor can we, because you know, given the time and the region, expertise. But I will focus on one question. Um, and that is what steps we are taking to address these lessons. 
And there's usually a, there's actually a concept that has been widely adopted, uh, which includes the many matters to address and where sustainable fisheries fit into. And it's called the blue economy. And um, I'm sure our next uh, panelist or the remaining panelists will delve deeper uh, into it. But uh, this concept uh, embodies an idea where countries may pursue and fulfill economic or social um, development plans while reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcities. So basically it offers the opportunity for growth and development uh, while promoting the protection of threatened and vulnerable ecological spaces. I hope that's simple enough. But let's take a closer look at its implementation and the practicality it serves for people at the community or national or even the regional level. So the Pacific Island countries have developed the narrative of what the blue economy should be in the region. And they have coined it, or they're calling this the 2050 strategy for the blue Pacific continent. And within this strategy, uh, sustainability is a key component that you know, it offers a, an array um, of, um, uh, you know, array of uh, uh, from different uh, economic sectors, you know, including fisheries. And there are multiple objectives set out to ensure that these priority areas are met for each country. So Fiji, for example, has uh, developed the National Oceans Policy, which uh, the Honorable Ambassador mentioned. And uh, included within it is the empowerment of government to uh, establish and designate marine protected areas to 30% of our 1.2 million square kilometers of ocean within our exclusive economic zone. And uh, the idea is that this initiative will, you know, move the country towards blue growth and raise blue economies and make them more sustainable in a sense. Um, and the idea, uh, but the practical implementation of things, um, it's, it's more nuanced and uh, there's, there's a lot to consider. But let me begin by saying that the Pacific Island countries have always been blue. You know, we've always had blue communities up until you know, the era of colonization and the introduction of capitalist market systems. And you know, from there, colonial powers capitalized on resource trade uh, industrialization and commerce, commercialization for profit. And in doing so, you know, it pushed these communities away from traditional practices uh, and into unsustainable practices, example, commercial fishing for livelihood security. So for Pacific Island countries, I find the idea of, you know, raising blue communities or pulling them towards uh, sustainable practices somewhat amusing because you know, they were pushed out of these practices in the beginning and they've been pushed away from being blue communities. And now we have packaged this idea of sustainability and blue growth as an opportunity for them to seize for their benefit. So then there is the question of, you know, the steps we are taking. And Fiji, for example, you know, in Fiji's example of designating marine protected areas to 30% of our total sea space, you know, it appears as a solution for sustainable fisheries uh, because these would be government gazetted no take zones. So you can't just go in and fish in it. But, you know, there are limitations to consider. So Pacific Islands like Fiji, you know, they've always had a form of customary protected areas and the traditional practices they adhered to uh, always ensured a level of sustainability in fisheries. And uh, in countries like Fiji, uh, that is multi-ethnic and uh, you know, multicultural, 
access to uh, resources in customary protected areas uh, was determined on entitlement. That's, that is those who have you know, customary, uh, exclusive customary rights to access specific areas to utilize or harvest resources for livelihood security. So if, if you're an indigenous person, uh, you're born with these customary rights and therefore the entitlement to access and uh, utilize uh, those resources within the customary boundary. And, um, you know, like I said, in a multi multicultural and multi-ethnic nation like Fiji, there are social dimensions that uh, need to be considered with, uh, you know, all terrestrial and marine spaces. And uh, there's a myriad of intersectionalities that exist uh, as this is unfolded down the line. And so there needs to be a balance. There needs to be a balance in this for environmental justice. And we need to unpack these dimensional aspects when we're looking at livelihood security of people in this lens. Yeah? And so now you take those same customary boundaries and then you codify them as national marine protected areas in the name of sustainability or the Blue Pacific, you know, these are areas that would now be, you know, possibly national no-take zones. So, you know, what does, where does that leave coastal communities or who are forced to now access and exploit uh, pockets of marine coastal areas, which are non-designated, you know, and what does it mean for their livelihood security? And, and what does it mean for the state of these ecological marine spaces that will now be heavily used. And just as an encouragement for us to consider the, the concept of sustainable fisheries and the blue economy objectively, you know, for any person analyzing and, and comparing how much of an area is managed, it is important to understand the objectives of what we want fulfilled. Uh, the designation and establishment of area-based management and protection measures. Um, it can differ in shape, in style, in objectives. And so, you know, some are conservation focused and that can include, you know, very strict measures. And that can range from no-take zones and reserves to um, areas where some activities are allowed and, and that's okay. And some are, sustainable use focused and managed by sectoral agencies. And with regards to fisheries in the Pacific, the, the whole of the oceans uh, is covered by management regimes to you know, manage fish stocks uh, sustainably and to avoid or, or mitigate adverse effects of fishing in marine spaces. And um, According to the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner, coverage of protected areas in relation to marine spaces is still small, with the Pacific Island countries making you know, moderate positive change. The same is for national coastal fisheries, where Pacific Island countries have also made moderate positive change. And uh, for Pacific Island countries, the, the household participation in fisheries and aquaculture in this disaggregated by urban rural areas, uh, including the proportion of households who consume fish has also seen a moderate positive change. You know, in fact, the stock status of key indicative uh, coastal fishery species has seen a declining change, even though the volume of fresh fish consumed per person per annum in Pacific Island countries has had little to no change. But when it comes to, you know, ticking the boxes for blue growth for sustainability, the Pacific Island countries has seen a significant positive change in the number of ocean policies established, in the number of ocean initiatives with capacity building. So it really is a wonder at this point, you know, the overall progress we are seeing and if the actions and measures we are taking are sufficient, uh, equitable, uh, inclusive, you know, is it meaningful and, and is it translating into outcomes needed for the Pacific to fulfill our 2050 uh, strategy for a blue Pacific continent? So here lies the conundrum, you know, in theory, it's, it's really good. 
but if governance fails to address these fundamental questions in achieving blue growth, then what is it? What is this designed to achieve? You know, in essence, you know, con uh, considering all these issues, it would be a failed management solution. But like I said, it heavily depends on the policymakers and their ability to ensure that these issues can be avoided. And it can, it can. And these are lessons that you know we have learned. But addressing these solutions for the benefit of everyone uh, and our environment, it needs to be done with diligence and careful attention. And one one example of a good step taken in Fiji is the establishment of the Women in Fisheries Network. You know that aims to enable opportunities for women uh, to be informed in all aspects of sustainable fisheries. And uh, I don't know, I think I've reached my time, but I will leave it there because you know there's a lot to think about and um, I leave it to the audience to use this information to gauge the direction that the uh, Pacific is taking. And um, if uh, the steps we are taking uh, is uh, uh, fast paced enough uh, towards blue growth for sustainable fisheries. And when you think about sustainable fisheries and the blue economy, you know, don't just think of it in a glamorized or sensationalized way, because it can be a feel good concept. Uh, and I encourage everyone to look and carefully consider the pros, the cons, and have dialogues like this and establish creative and meaningful avenues that work for everyone and benefits our environment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fina. Thank you so much, Rufina, for your thoughts on the topic this evening. I just wanted to also um, um, have a comment from you on, um, on, you know, it's related to what you said, you know, blue economy is seen as this, like a, a savior model, like, you know, it's an alternative model to the traditional, economic development model. But doesn't the, the very core of the blue economy model, doesn't it still sit within the traditional, you know, sort of model that's that we, we've had running from, you know, exploiting resources, it looks at natural resources as commodities, and it exploits that for natural growth. Isn't that somewhat true? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, so like I said, it's, we've always, We've always had blue communities. It's always been embedded in in our culture, in our in our tradition, and uh, it's it's just the the idea of how the narrative is is being relayed. You know, uh, we don't want it. Uh, we want to build a narrative that works for uh, the region, and not just fits into the agenda of what. Um, the global, um, what, what all the other larger developed countries uh, want uh, to see from us. Yeah, and also the the question is how much of this trickles down to the communities, you know, at grassroots level, how much of this, this structure, this policy will trickle down to them. All right, thank you so much, Fina, thank you so much. Next we'll... Um... We're going to uh, Dr. Peter Rouge, our ne uh, next presenter. Let me just pull up this slide. Thank you very much again, Rufino. I'm, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker. He is joining us from the UK. He is an associate professor at uh, Staffordshire University with a background in technology and art. Now his talk may be a bit different, but very much related to the other two talks that we, we will uh, listen to this evening. And today he will be sharing with us his expert opinion on how the creative and cultural industry can support the blue economy in small island developing states. And with that, let's please welcome our next speaker, Dr. Peter Rouge. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, good evening, good afternoon to wherever you are. Um, it, it might seem like I'm perhaps on the wrong webinar, uh, given my background, uh, as a film producer, and I'm I'm here talking with marine scientists. Uh, but but I, if, if you bear with me on this, I think some of the points that have been raised um, 
relate to really what I'm going to talk about. And I'm just going to share my screen, uh, if that's okay, because I want to uh, just do a little bit of a presentation. So just bear with me a second. Oh, Susanna, are you able to enable screen sharing for me? Um, leave. Hold on. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you can you can see that and that's uh, clear. So the subject of the talk really is um, about how the creative and cultural industries can support the blue economy in small island states. And I, I've called it mixing blue and orange. Um, you might be aware uh, that 2021 is the United Nations year of creative economy for sustainable development. And this was announced by UNESCO as a year long uh, promotion of the creative industries and the cultural industries as a way of driving sustainable development. And these sectors are known really as the orange economy. And the interesting thing about the orange economy is that it, it brings together culture, the arts, technology and commerce into a whole range of different sectors, everything from, from dance and literature all the way through to high technology sectors like games design and immersive technologies um, and visual effects that we see in cinema. And one of the interesting things about the creative economy is that it is a high technology, highly innovative group of sectors. It also provides a lot of employment for uh, young people. It's, it's the biggest international employer of people aged 18 to 25, which is quite an interesting stat. And it also is uh, a high employer of women. So it, it, it's an important part of all of those sustainable development goals that uh, Mr. Ambassador was talking about. Uh, and I think he made a really interesting point that the blue economy is really about taking a holistic approach to sustainability and how we deliver the STGs. So when we're, when we're looking at making sustainability holistic, we, we want to look at every sector. We want to look at how all these different sectors can support each other. Um, so in terms of what a creative and cultural economy could do to support the blue economy, there are some ways that perhaps are not immediately obvious, but I think I'm gonna try and illustrate some of those points next. Um, we all know what's happened with COVID and the impact that it's had on the world. Um, it's been devastating for a lot of countries, but I think this is really revealing uh, that small island developing states have been hit incredibly hard by COVID. Uh, we've seen the collapse of tourism that provides a huge amount of uh, international revenue to these countries. And I think when we're looking at these stats, it's really important that we think about how we can broaden SIDS economies, how we can look at all the sectors that can support an island state and not just think about it in terms of the blue economy. Because when you do have major international shocks in the way that we've seen, we want to be able to look at how resilience can be part of the discussion going forward for island states and for the blue economy. We're trying to build, as so many people have said, uh, a new normal, we want to try and build back better. And I think to do that, for island states, we have to think about the blue economy not being 
the whole part of a country's economic makeup. We have to think about how other sectors can support the blue economy. And I think a really good point that um, was made in terms of, and I think Susanna, you made this point about the blue economy being um, part of a traditional resource intensive industry. And I think that is very true. You know, the, the blue economy is set up and is made up of the exploitation of natural resources. If we want to start broadening SIDS economies, then I think we have to look at sectors that can support it, but also offer alternatives to heavy use of natural resources. And the creative and cultural industries are great at doing that. Let me give you an example. Um, games design, for instance, um, now has the ability to share content, share assets digitally across the world. A games designer based in Fiji can exploit their talent and exploit their production into a global market. And there is no natural resource exploitation in that process. So all of a sudden now we have an opportunity where a sector and a population on a small island can integrate into the national economy, can integrate into all those national supply chains, but do it in a digital way. We're not reliant on shipping natural resources across the world. So in terms of how we look at carbon footprint, how we look at how we're using natural resources, these creative and cultural sectors, particularly those that use technology, can be a really important part of how we look at going forward. Uh, another example might be, um, and Rufino talked about a, a really interesting point in terms of the cultural aspects of fisheries. There's an opportunity for cultural heritage to be promoted and exploited economically. And you can do that through the blockchain. The blockchain offers the ability for creators, craftspeople in whatever sector to be able to sell their goods across the world and get the proper value for those goods because they can authenticate the value through the blockchain. So this is again, all part of that creative technology aspects that we can integrate into island communities. And it's something that I uh, talked about in a book that was recently published uh, called Beyond the Blue Economy, which is looking really at, at how those creative and cultural industries can play a key role in sustainable development for these islands. Um, and what I tried to do was to set out a practical and a theoretical and a policy framework for how that might happen. And what it does is it seeks to position the digital and creative industries, not as something separate to the blue economy, but as a, as a supporter of that, as a way that the blue economy, which is for an island state, the most important sector, but what it can't be is the only sector. You have to think about it in terms of all the support that can go around it. And, and there's a really good reason for that because the more you exploit one sector economically, the less opportunity you have to pre preserve it and maintain its environmental status. I'm gonna just show you a, a, a really quick, this is a very, basic and uh, very simple visual explanation of really what, I, what I'm trying to say. Um, there's a continuum that economic uh, activity sits on. And, and at one end, on the, on the left, you have the maximum environmental protection. And on the right, you have the maximum economic exploitation. And somewhere, there's that little needle, that little needle that sits on that continuum. And it's where we are, where a country is in terms of how it uses its natural resources. 
So at one end, you have that maximum environmental protection. If we're talking about the oceans, it's the preservation of those oceans to the maximum amount possible. Now that's not really realistic. <clears throat> when we're talking about island states that rely on the blue economy, that rely so heavily on the oceans, that, that, that's not realistic. We can go to the opposite end where we exploit that resource to the maximum amount possible, but that's not really desirable. We don't want to go there because we want to achieve what the blue economy sets out to do, which is to be a sustainable use of those resources. The problem is that that continuum is pulled by two opposing forces. And those forces are subject to all kinds of different factors that play on it in, in a very dynamic way. You have population growth, you have the needs of, of an economy that has just gone through the kind of shocks that we've seen. So that needle moves back and forth along that continuum, as I said, in, in a very highly dynamic environment. But let me, let me try and give you perhaps a hypothetical example of what I'm talking about. Let's say we have uh, a country that is 100% reliant on the oceans fisheries, for example, or tourism, and it has no other economic sectors. Now, that reliance on that natural resource inevitably is going to put a huge amount of pressure on that needle to move towards economic exploitation. Because there are no other sectors that that country can use to provide for its people. So placing all of that emphasis on that one sector inevitably pushes us away from environmental protection. But let's imagine now that we start adding in another sector. Let's say that we start to look at e-commerce. Let's say we start to look at financial services or in the sectors that I'm talking about, the knowledge economy, digital creative technology sectors. Every time we add a new sector into that economic mix, the pressure on the blue economy is eased. That needle then can start moving back down towards environmental protection because you're not placing the, the huge pressure on a single natural resource that we were if we had no other sectors to rely on. So it, it, it seems if you like, a, an entirely logical argument. I think what often happens is that there is such a focus on the blue economy in terms of the literature and the discussions and the research and the policy that we often forget that there are other ways that we can support the oceans. There are other ways that we can maintain fish stocks, that we can look after coral reefs that's not just about the blue economy. It's about how we look at the whole broad aspect of what we are doing in our economic and social and cultural environments. So what we want to do is we want to move that needle back down towards environmental protection. But we, we have to make sure that we have growth for our growing populations. We, have, we want to look after people. We want to give people the quality of life that they want to have. So we can't go back 200 years, we can't go back 300 years, we have to work with what we've got. So in terms of using the creative and the digital and the cultural sectors, they can come into that economic mix to support the blue economy so that we can put more emphasis on that environmental protection. Because you know we don't want to go to this. You know, this is this is not what we want. You know, there's uh, my scientists, my scientist colleagues who have been speaking will know this probably better than I. But global fish stocks are already 30, 35 percent overfished. Um, 
90% of the world's coral reefs are under threat of destruction by the middle of this decade. The mid, that, that's three years away. That's three or four years away. That's not sometime in the future. So we have to try and reconcile the need of those two competing factors in some way. And we have to do that in a way that is sustainable. So that gap between the ocean resource and our economic need has to be addressed somewhere. And that's where adding those other sectors in, taking that holistic approach that Mr. Ambassador talked about is hugely important. If we want to protect our oceans and our fish stocks, if we want to deliver the SDGs by 2030, the decade of action that we are now well into, we have to take that holistic approach. And that holistic approach is about looking at all the aspects of island life and island economics and social and cultural aspects. And I think um, I, I kind of want to bring us back to the year of creative economy um, because it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to have those discussions, to use the fact that the United Nations are promoting the creative economy this year, to have these discussions, to talk about how we can connect those sectors to the blue economy, how we can build that strong interconnectedness, that multi-sector, multi-technology multi and multi-research approach to looking at the situations that we're in. You know, we've already seen what technologies like um, virtual reality, extended realities have done for healthcare, for construction, for uh, public services. The same can be done for fisheries. The same can be done for ocean health. We can use these creative technologies to help not just deliver other sectors that can support it, but can deliver innovation within the blue economy itself, if we look outside of it. So I think my, I suppose in summing up what I, what I tried to say here is, and I, I just want to show this because I love this photograph. Um, this was me in uh, St. Lucia a few years ago where I was doing some workshops with young entrepreneurs. These are young, creative digital entrepreneurs in St. Lucia and I was there and I've been there over the last few years doing some workshops with them. And I think what we need to look at is what our young people need and what our young people want. They want to be able to spend their lives there, spend their time with their families in their homes. They want to be able to not have to move away to have the lives that they want. They don't want to be in a position where they are not able to achieve their dreams for themselves and for their families. So the more that we can build strong and sustainable and crucially resilient economies in SIDS, the better it will be. We've seen what happened with COVID. We don't want to be going back there again. But those economic shocks, those health shocks may well be coming down the line. What we need to do is make sure that we can make island communities resilient and support the blue economy by looking at all the other sectors and crucially those high wage, high skill jobs that we find in the knowledge economy in the digital creative and cultural sectors. Um, so I, I think I've probably, I've probably gone over my time as I always tend to do. But what I, what I will say is I'd be really happy if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, that is my email. I'm always happy to talk about this uh, and to look at how we can uh, share ideas and share research. Um, so please do get in touch uh, and obviously happy to answer any questions at the end. Uh, Susanna, back to you. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Uh, hi, Susanna, sorry, you're on mute. 
Oh, sorry, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rouge. Thank you. I just, so what you're saying is, you know, just to be clear, eh, that blue economy is great. The concept is great. It is essential to developing nations like Fiji and the Solomon Islands, but it can't be the only the only driver of socioeconomic development, right? It can't be the only solution. We have to have other options. And yeah, I yeah, think if we're, yeah. if we're looking for an example, we need to look no further than our own economy, the Fijian economy right now, it, the tourist industry, the tourism industry is, and we just don't have the money to be able to support it temporarily, right? Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. You know, and I think the, you know, the blue economy is still going to be absolutely front and center uh, for small island states like Fiji or, or like we find in the Caribbean or, the, you know, the Indian Ocean. But it, it's a case of looking at how we how we make our ocean sustainable in the best possible way. And by by looking at our whole economic mix, looking at all the different sectors that can come in to support it. Mm. we've got the best opportunity of making those sectors sustainable and, and making sure that you know countries don't find themselves in the situation they are now where you know pe people losing livelihoods you know that's that's the crucial thing people in these places are losing their livelihoods and facing real hardship it, and it's not about some abstract academic concept or theory it's about people's lives on the ground that we need to work at Right. And for for Fiji, in my opinion, I don't think we have reached, you know, that's that space yet where we need like we can develop the digital and technological um, industry. And if there is any present, I know that, you know, the there's no serious consideration. They're not taken seriously. How can we how can we change that? It, it, listen, these are these are not insignificant barriers to, to developing sectors like that um but i think it starts with i think it starts with education you know i think you you want to look at how you can educate the next generation of innovators and entrepreneurs and give them the opportunity and, and make make them aware that there there are opportunities to do this but it, it, it has to be it has to be a combination of education and government policy and an, and a, a realization i think by the research community as well you know we as part of that community we we tend to be very focused on our on our own areas on our own sectors and i think as a research community it's important that we look beyond that that we look outside of that so that we can we can collaborate we can have uh multidisciplinary projects multidisciplinary mm -hmm. Uh, research where we can look at how sectors can come together so I, I think it's you know it's, it's not an easy process but I think you start with education I, I think you start with education both in terms of formal education of young people but in terms of talking to governments and policy makers and letting them know that there are opportunities here because they might never have really seen that as an option uh, because the focus has always been very much on the blue economy uh, and the focus entirely being on that. So I think if right. we can open up those discussions, then there, there are opportunities to develop these sectors. Mm. Right, and, and unless we, we quickly come to that uh, realization, I think the very resources that we're trying to sustainably develop will be you know, overexploited and run out in the very, very near future. Yeah, I mean, that, that's absolutely hitting the nail on the head. Um, you know, the blue economy is about sustainable use of the oceans. But at the moment, we are at a point where we are over exploiting them. You know, we're, right. we're, there's, you know, you look at the, um, the actions of European Union commercial fishing in the Indian Ocean and what they've done to tuna stocks. Um, you look at the proposals for seabed mining. You know, that's hugely destructive. You know, we're, we're talking about the blue economy, but our actions are not really helping. Uh, so we have to find some other ways of, of doing it. Right.
Thank you so much, Dr. Rouge. We'll come back to you towards the end of the session with the Q&A. Let's now Thanks, go Susan. and um, speak to Namely. Namely, are you, are you ready? Yes, hello. You're okay? Okay, just let me introduce yes. you once again. <laughs> All right, uh, Nemily is joining us from the Solomon Islands. She has a um, research background in environmental geoscience and uh, resource management. She has a master's degree from the University of the South Pacific. And today, Nemily will share with us her opinions on what she has learned about the role of uh, traditional knowledge in sustainable fisheries. So please, let's now turn our attention to Ms. Nemily Ngarara. Nemily. Well, firstly, apologize for uh, some technical problem I faced here. And thank you so much, Susanna, for that lovely introduction. And um, firstly, uh, I would like to acknowledge the AIS firm secretary for giving me the opportunity to be one of the presenter today. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking on the topic, the role of traditional ecological knowledge in sustainable fisheries in the Pacific this will be a Pacific Island con in Pacific Island context. So I believe there are a lot of discussion about these topics already discussed. Um, however, today I'm going to just share uh, and mostly reiterated some of the important points that, and lessons that we can learn and might share my experience as the Pacific Islander and as someone who uh, recently um, completed my studies uh, in, in a coastal communities as, um, in the Pacific Islands, in, especially in, in Fiji. So how do we define uh, sustainable fisheries? Uh, well, uh, in a written definition, well-written definition, we can say that um, as, to attain a sustainable fishery is to maintain uh, a fish stock or fish population within a sustainable rate. So uh, how do we attain sustainable fishery through understanding our traditional knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge? Or in other words, how is traditional knowledge relevant to, to achieving a sustainable fisheries? Well, uh, before we dig in deep into, uh, let's define what is traditional knowledge, I believe, um, uh, most uh, have knowledge on that. It, it is a knowledge practice that within the community that passed down from generation through a social responsibilities in the community. People practices uh, different uh, practices within times and space. Um, so now we can um, look at how traditional knowledge is relevant in achieving sustainable fisheries. So I will just share a few examples in um, that um, how traditional knowledge um, can be used to ach achieve a sustainable fisheries uh, in, in a Pacific Island context. So uh, traditional knowledge, there's um, through different fishing practices, techniques, and we believe that the cultural beliefs that uh, exists in the community that, that we can learn from, as well as there's um, the spiritual beliefs that most Pacific Island community that have, that we can learn from as well. So uh, I will just share one of the community that have carried out my research in that they believe that um, when going out fishing, uh, you're not allowed to throw rubbish within the sea. This is a belief that they have connection with, uh, with the marine resources, but it directly, uh, this belief directly influence uh, uh, a, a clean environment, which directly uh, influence and affecting when we, we should, uh, this belief affect the way that we can achieve a sustainable fisheries as well. So, well, uh, we looked at this directly in have a positive impact on the marine environment, as well as another one is traditional management, which include taboo areas that the communities have. Uh, so the traditional knowledge in uh, having set aside certain times that um, to um, maintain um, 
a taboo time that's uh, pro, pro that this the, this one is the elders usually uh, are the ones that um are the ones that um manage to um to organize in the community so another one is the spiritual beliefs that this is forbidden that they include some food certain marine resources that are that are forbidden to eat this like leads to sustainable uh when we uh come to understand different communities in the pacific islands the way they uh they have this belief that there are certain food that certain marine species or marine resources that are not allowed to be uh to eat or allowed to to take this uh, when we understand when we come to understand it um it, it we, we we will achieve sustainable fishery through understanding the different beliefs that uh that um linked to the community in in the fisheries uh, mostly in in the pacific island community well traditional knowledge it links as well to understanding the marine spaces in fishing grounds um within spaces within the uh, community coastal communities especially in um in the pacific island uh, this includes um uh, like within for example within uh, a space men and men and women can use the same space but they have different knowledge about the same space so uh in understanding the different knowledge that both men and women have within the marriage marine spaces it can lead to um uh, allowing us to have a policy that uh can lead leads better to a sustainable fisheries well um so how what can we learn from and from um from understanding traditional knowledge in especially in pacific island context uh, it is important to um to to recognize the importance of indigenous people and the knowledge uh so that uh government and policy making can contribute can um work together with the communities that are uh, and recognizing the different uh uh, practices that are already in place so that uh, we can achieve through this I, I believe that we can achieve sustainable fishery uh, and there's a, a lot of lessons that we can learn from the from Pacific Island communities in terms of uh, traditional beliefs and um, uh, practices that already exist within the community so with that um, with that um that's all i can share today and i believe there will be a lot of discussion um that uh, we can do uh after this thank you thank you thanks nemily thank you so much i i like that point that you made about the traditional ecological knowledge you know the, there are very important characteristics of traditional knowledge that makes it so valuable to fisheries management yeah one is that it's developed over a long period of time you know and it's passed down through generations uh, it's experience based and it has a lot of um, important social cultural and biological dimensions as well right yes yes it is and and uh the practices that exist in 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 certain communities in the pacific island it's it's based on experience it's based on experience mm -hmm. and there's a lot of uh, lesson that we can learn from from especially the, the local people like they use those that use uh, uh, the spaces yeah marine spaces also namely another question that I am that I had you know a lot of times when we have uh, development projects or for example if we use the marine protected area example you know when they, when government or any other body is trying to set up these areas of development or protected areas we sometimes a lot of times actually we turn to traditional knowledge to fill in the gaps you know the biological gaps so what's there what's not there where and you know that type of knowledge but the thing is if it's good enough to use for sort of the, the primary um the sort of the base of trying to Put together these development projects why is it not why is it sometimes that um, traditional knowledge is so easily dismissed in science you know 
Uh, I believe that um, uh, it needs to, uh, there's a lot of empowering that needs to be done, especially for the local people so that they have voices. There are sometimes that their voices are not really heard, especially that, that those people that hold that knowledge, their voices are not really heard in, in the platform that uh, the policy needs to be implemented. So I believe that there are a lot of this need to be empowered, the local people need to be empowered in order for that they, they have the voices to be heard as well, especially in the scientific community that so that the knowledge or that knowledge need to be to fill in the gap to yeah to that okay thank you namely um i believe uh, mr ambassador has a has a question thank you susanna it's uh, not a question just some packing remarks after listening to the excellent uh, presentations from the uh, three learned uh, colleagues and uh, also i have another appointment in the next hour so i better do it now then run away to the the other uh, the, I'm hearing the presentations and I entirely agree uh, what uh, Peter and uh, Rufino mentioned, uh, the needs to build a resilience in our domestic uh, capacities uh, to handle what is now called the, the Blue Pacific narrative. Most of you might not know the genesis of the Blue Pacific narrative. I've been part of, you know, I have historical information on that, but let that not be part of it. But the thing is, the Blue Pacific narrative was driven on a political agenda by one of our, our, our regional metropolitan powers. So it's, it's not really something that is based on science for us in the Pacific. And uh, that is why I, I, I really like this discourse, this exchange of views, because at the end of the day, there are lots of things that will be tested, the robustness of the legislation, the policies, uh, the implementation mechanism, the financing mechanism, whether all these things can be able to attract that. So I, I thought, you know, the, the discussion, the narrowing down by Peter and Rufina uh, is really, really good, coupled by the, by the, by the presentation by Nemli. The traditionals are very, very important here. We cannot, we cannot just go and create a half-made solution. Mm. It has to be a total you know, a holistic approach, as I said in my in my presentation. So blue economy is 100% uh, reliance on oceans, as uh, Peter mentioned. Again, for Fiji, you might uh, recall that I I'd never mentioned the blue economy in my presentation. So I just want to make that uh, the subtle clarification. The policy needs to be right. The policy has to be homegrown to meet our social, our economic our sustainable development aspirations for the future. So I, I, I fully, fully enjoy listening and uh, listening to, to the presentation. And I hope that uh, we can continue this kind of uh, discourses in the future uh, so that we can be able to share this, particularly you young uh, you know, players into the game. You know, we are going beyond our uh, time doing this for almost 30 years. It's, we're getting tired of the fight, but... <laughs> I, 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 thank, I thank you all. I thank you, Susanna. I thank you for the energy, uh, for the coordination, for the presentation, which uh, I, I really, really support. Whatever outcomes comes in out of this meeting, count me in. I'll, I'll support you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll stop here. I'll have to go to another appointment. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, can I please invite all the um, speakers back onto the screen and we'll start with our Q&A session. Our first question is for Mr. Varrea. During this pandemic lockdown, uh, restricted movements have certainly reduced fishing activity and access to fish for food security has been reduced, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you think the importance or role of sustainability has been affected here? Rufino. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so to, to be fair, uh, I don't really know. Um, I'm not 100% on like the knowledge of how, how many people, how, sorry, how fishing activities has reduced or if it has uh, 
at all and uh, are you asking about like you know uh, small scale subsistence fishing or is this commercial fishing and uh, mm. if in the case that it has reduced there are also other variables to consider mm. uh, because uh, there are some services that have continued and um, and I don't know whether they have been operational but they, you know there are there are services uh, along the coastal areas as well that have been <laughs> operational and uh, I'm just not so sure about its impact um, on the marine environment in that, in that sense. All right. Okay, thank you. I'll, uh, the next question I'll give to Nemeli. How important is it to keep the cultural protected areas as they are? Or, or Rufino, and then it says in Fiji, if there were more protected areas, would these lead to more sustainability? Emily, you um, want to answer? Yes. Uh, yeah, I believe it is important to uh, it is important to um, to keep the cultural protected areas. Uh, however, it is important as well to recognize the need of the local community, uh, especially understanding the whole community to their social. Uh, the social aspect of the community itself is important. One thing is important to uh, to protect the cultural protected area, and another thing is to understand how the people uh, approach to that to their protected area. So uh, I believe uh, it is equally important to to protect the cultural area as well as understanding the community, those that look after those protected area. Mm -hmm. um, Fino, and I guess the second part will be to you. The, the question is, you know, does protected area equal sustainability? So uh, it really depends. I'll give you an example. So just having, you know, uh, multiple protected areas uh, in a specific uh, space, marine space, uh, you you have to ask the question like what is the purpose it is trying to fulfill what is the objective uh, because if you're just opening like uh, protected areas around let's say uh, coral reef systems and you leave out mangrove areas when we know that they are all interconnected so so people observe um, the protected areas around the uh, coral reef. Uh, uh, section and then they exploit the mangrove uh, uh, areas, uh, probably cut down mangrove trees, over harvest, and then you have sedimentation and then it kills out the coral reefs. Uh, so what have you achieved in that sense? So you, so you really need to have a balance and think about the purpose you want uh, as this objective, you know, to fulfill what, what do you want fulfilled and how is the best way to go about it while taking into consideration, as Namili said, the social uh, dimension. Mm. All right, Namili, we have another question for you. Can you talk uh, to the different cultural knowledge that is held by women versus men? There is work coming out of Fiji showing the critical role women play in fisheries in coping after disasters and the traditional knowledge held by women. Are you seeing the same in the Solomon Islands? I guess he's, uh, this person is asking about uh, stratification of knowledge. Is this the same? sort of seen in here in Fiji and uh, in the Solomon Islands? Uh, yes, there are uh, um, the Solomon Islands is just uh, mostly um, the critical role as well that uh, women and men are placed in fisheries, in, uh, in coastal fisheries here in the Solomon Islands, the same as in Fiji. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, the women mostly uses those uh, spaces that closes, most closes, closes to the closer to the, the village. So mm -hmm. the role that women uh, plays uh, after disaster, they, they call, most of them, they, uh, women glean mostly on this area that they have more knowledge. So when the disaster, it's something that they're resilient about within the mm -hmm. area that they have knowledge about uh, specific marine resources that they harvested in, in those areas. So yeah, I think right. it's mostly the same, yeah. 
Yeah, and knowledge is, is not only stratified in, in terms of gender, right? It's stratified by age, by geographical location, right? There's a lot of uh, stratification in traditional knowledge that needs to be, you know, systemized before we becomes irrelevant or is so, because it's so easily dismissed by science now. Yes. Um, yes. Let's also look at uh, another question. There's a question here. How do we ensure that this, uh, I guess this is for Dr. Rouge, how do we ensure that this orange economy not only protects environment resources, but at the same time also ensures a social sustainability and empowerment for local communities? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think one of, the, one of the key aspects of the creative and cultural industries is that they are um, they're incredibly diverse. Uh, they have uh, a real attraction for young people. I think they, they have an opportunity to, to engage lots of different aspects of, of culture and society. But I, I think it, what, it, what is really crucial is making sure that we don't just see the orange economy as something that's so often said that it's you know it's it's nice to do it's something well you know the arts are nice they're great but actually we need to concentrate on the important things and I, that, that's a narrative you hear all over the world you know you hear it in in developed countries um as well as in small island states and i i think the the important part of the sustainability uh, argument for creative and cultural industries is that they are not resource heavy. They are not reliant on, uh, you know, the, the use of uh, land, particularly. They're not uh, reliant on the use of uh, oceans. What what they can do, and that this is kind of relating to what Emily was talking about, um, is that can, they can be a great supporter of, of cultural heritage and cultural knowledge, and a, and a great engager of that. Uh, cultural knowledge, because it, it's it's a part of how you how you define a culture and how you define a society through its heritage. That can be uh, a, a great uh, aspect for. I don't want to use the word exploiting, um, but it, it's a great opportunity to use that as part of your economy. You know, as part of your uh, as part of your growth, um, as we've seen. You know, if you if you go to many places, they will talk about um, their their cultural heritage in terms of buildings and places you can go and visit. But cultural knowledge can also be the the stories, the oral histories, the knowledge that is contained within a people, and that's an opportunity that you can use to share that knowledge through content, through the creation of content, through the creation of whether that's films or whether it's any, any other kind of content, there is an opportunity to take that cultural knowledge and to share it and to not only promote your, your cultural heritage, but to use that as part of your economic growth. Uh, so it, it, I think it's, it's an interesting question in terms of how you engage those creative and cultural sectors uh, with not just uh, countries that are very focused on perhaps one natural resource or one sector, but but also in terms of how you then look forward and how you engage with young people, both at you know school, college, university, and how you make them aware that the knowledge sectors, the creative and cultural sectors, can be a route that they can take. You know there, there are. There can be great careers and lives there for you. And if we can build the infrastructure, particularly things like digital connectivity, you don't have to leave your home to do that. You can build a great career in these industries in the places where you live and perhaps where you want to stay. Thank you. Our next question is from, from Timothy to Nemeli. Does some traditional ecological knowledge, is it in line with the current legal sub, sustainable fisheries laws within the Pacific Island countries? Is traditional ecological knowledge in line with, with um, 
legal policies. Yeah, I believe there are um, the knowledge of especially that the the community have is in, in implementing uh, taboo areas uh, in the community. That's the knowledge that I've been passed from generation. It's the same, most of the same as the, the policy that uh, that implementing MPAs. That's the policy from the government that are the laws that are implemented from the government. It's quite the same as the knowledge that they have in place already, which is uh, people have taboo areas uh, already. It before we implement, before we have uh, sort of uh, the, the the MPA word, the the, the people, the, the local community already have their uh, ways of managing their resource. So it's more the same in, but in different. They understand it in a different context. I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, um, the next question is from John. How can growing populations, for example, in the Solomon Islands, adapt to sustainable fishing? That's a... He doesn't say to who, but I'm assuming it's to you, Namely. He's asking about the Solomon Islands. Okay, well... Namely, did you hear that one? Or I guess we'll move on to the next question. This is for Rufino. Are there steps being taken to protect the Pacific Ocean from international fishing and game fishing in order to maintain sustainable fisheries? I guess this is more offshore. Yes, uh, a very interesting question. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I am actually not uh, very familiar with um, with uh, regulations around uh, that uh, that particular question, uh, and so I don't think uh, I can provide an answer that can do it any justice. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Fino. Let me look at the next question. Um, let's see. Oh, the next question is to you again, Fina, from Hilda uh, from RMIT University. Our Pacific Islands, like the Solomon Islands and Fiji, have tuna factories, and this involves large scale commercial fishing. In regard to Blue Pacific, are they using sustainable fishing methods and monitoring, and how are the fisheries implementing or mitigating the use of methods? like trolling that trapped unwanted fish like dolphins and um, I guess bycatch for sustainable commercial fishing. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to like the uh, tuna fisheries industry, uh, I think it's one of the things that the uh, Pacific Island countries pride itself in and they, and they, and they uh, have invested a lot in this specific industry in the Pacific uh, because uh, not just mm. for its friends, you know, um, international negotiations, they've been able to use this as a, as a bargaining chips as well because it's um, so promising. Um, but, uh, and so they, they have invested, uh, 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 heavily invested in terms of technology and, and manpower. I know that, uh, you know, for bycatch, one of, they have observers on, on boats and um, there is always room to uh, improve. For example, establishing uh, or strengthening uh, occupational, uh, you know, safety hazard regulations, and ensuring ensuring their safety uh, for the observers while while on board of uh, fishing vessels and they're out at out at sea. Uh, so yes, I hope that. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. You know. I guess our main shared resources in terms of offshore fisheries is, is tuna, right? And um, yeah. Pacific Island countries, because we have such a large EZ, we have taken a very strong stand against illegal fishing. But you know, our resources are very limited. You know, how, how can you just comment on how, maybe to, to sort of uh, get the picture for the question, how heavily we rely on um, international um, surveillance and monitoring for our 
for the protection of our oceans and resources? Uh, uh, you know, uh, Pacific Island countries uh, don't have the, the um, for example, they rely heavily on Australia, New Zealand Navy for monitoring uh, uh, illegal fishing vessels uh, entering uh, our spaces and um, also relying on them to help these countries bring them to task uh, because they have the capacity to step in. Uh, so yes, we, we do rely heavily and, uh, on, on international uh, partners uh, in, in that way. And um, I'm sure that yes, for Pacific Island countries, it's, there's still some way to go uh, before we can, you know, take this on ourselves. Mm. All right, thank you so much. Um, we have a few more questions, but unfortunately we are, towards, we are at the end of our session this evening. I'm sorry, we have reached our time. And um, with that, I'd just like to take a moment to thank everyone. Thank you so much to our viewers for joining us today. Thank you so much for your interest and your time. And a huge and a special thank you to all our speakers. Thank you so much, Namely. Thank you, Rufina. And thank you so much, Dr. Rouge, for joining us this evening. And thank you for your enlightening talk. And we, we thoroughly enjoyed your, uh, your opinions. I think, I, I guess, to, to wrap up our, um, our whole session today, we've learned that you know the, the blend of new and old can be our salvation in terms of sustainability. And we can move forward with the best that science can offer in terms of uh, renewable energy, technology, food production, conservation, biology, to be able to, I don't think we can undo the damage that the past has done, but we can move towards restoring um, a healthier system. And it has a lot to do with our attitudes toward the environment. I think when we're able to change our attitude, the way in which we use our resources and the way we view um, natural resources, we can fundamentally transform um, our future going forward from here. Um, do we have any last um, words from you, the speakers? Uh, well, I'd, I'd just like to say a really big thank you for the invite um, and for listening to me a little bit off topic. Um, and, and 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 being to being tolerant of that, but and it was great, and it was really really interesting to hear um, Nemily and Rafina talk about their work and, and the aspects there. And just to say that I'd be, you know, delighted to carry on any conversations after this, and to see, you know, what we might do, see if there are any opportunities for for some of the collaborations, you know, that, that perhaps we've discussed and thought about. So, yeah, just a really big thank you for the invite as well. Thank you, Dr. Rouge. Just, just before you leave, I actually have another, uh, the last question for you. And this is from um, Mayo, uh, Mr. Sammy Simer. I know this guy and he plays a huge part in my master. So I would like to get this question across to you. Are there any countries in the region or globally implementing orange economy policy in efficient scale? And how does this match with blue economy? Uh... There's, there's none that I'm aware of specifically. Um, th there is some work being done uh, with um, data visualizations around fish stocks, which is using some of the concepts um, that we see in visual effects um, and design. So there, there are some, um, but it's a little bit tenuous at the moment. Um, and I, I think it's a case of exploring some options and, it, and it's a case of having dialogues uh, i think that's that's the really important thing it's, it's about these sectors coming together you know and sharing ideas and, and having dialogues and seeing where the connective points will be and i think if we do that we'll find that there are options uh for how we can move forward and how we can integrate some of these uh creative technologies into things like uh, fish management and um, environmental protection. So I'm, I'm happy Thank to talk you. to anybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, back to you, Fino and Emil. Emily, sorry. All right. First, um, I really apologize for technical issue have have. Um, thank you for the 
really, really well, uh, great discussion we have. And I believe there's still a lot of discussion that needs to be done. So I look forward mm -hmm. to more going forward with this. So yeah, thank you so much um, for the opportunity again. Yes, uh, big dinaka to everyone. Uh, thank you for um, listening in and all the interesting uh, questions. I wish we could have gone through each and every one of it. Um, but and I'm I'm very happy if you wish to reach out to me uh, for more details, uh, etc. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you, Nemeli. Thank you, Fino. And thank you, uh, Dr. Rouge. And we appreciate you being here. Thanks again to all of you joining us. And uh, we hope to see you again next time in our next session. And with that, we bid you good night. Nisa Mwadimanda. And until next time. The Archipelagic and Island States Forum is a platform designed to facilitate 47 archipelagic and island nations to collaborate and cooperate in addressing common challenges in four thematic areas, climate change mitigation and adaptation, blue economy, marine plastic debris, and good maritime governance. In 2017, the idea to establish the multinational cooperation framework among the archipelagic and island states was first iterated during the UN Ocean Conference in New York. In November 2018, Indonesia hosted the first ministerial meeting with 21 archipelagic and island states. The Archipelagic and Island States Forum was established by Manando Joint Declaration. In the following year, the second ministerial meeting adopted the final outcome with 25 AIS participating countries. To achieve our vision, we focus on four objectives which we translate into our pro programs. Create an open, innovative, and engaging forum. Provide a space to share and implement innovative and tangible programs. Promote collaborative efforts among stakeholders. And create opportunity through the blue economy. Ideation, implementation, and evaluation are the core elements to our solution framework in addressing the problems. In 2020, AIS Forum launched programs to drive innovation, which are AIS Joint Research, a collaborative applied research program affiliated with academic institution in AIS countries with various topics related to the four areas of collaboration. The Innovator Scholarship Program, a fully funded exchange program for talented individuals from AIS participating countries who can demonstrate exceptional leadership quality and creative mind and AIS Innovation Challenge to find innovative ideas and breakthroughs that can help societies and businesses to be more resilient and adaptive during crisis situations. AIS Forum also launched AIS Blue Startup Hub, a platform to connect marine-focused startup in 47 archipelagic and island states across the globe. AIS Blue Startup Hub Mentoring Program was launched with 18 participating startups from six countries as an effort to realize the smart, innovative solutions, AIS Forum also engaged with public audiences through online events in a form of trainings, workshops, talk shows, and discussions with various topics and stakeholders across AIS participating countries. In light of COVID-19 pandemic, it is important for archipelagic and island states to have a resilient economy. Therefore, AIS Forum Secretariat introduces programs which focuses on blue economy. As a form of its commitment, AIS Forum developed Blue Economy Development Index, or BEDI. This index will be used as a tracking tool to determine the current use of coastal and marine resources. And it can be used as a tool to meet the sustainable development goals. Blue Financing Framework, or BFF, which provides a guidance for governments, financial institutions, philanthropists, and donors to align their investments with the Blue Economy principles and allow them to select a project to be financed in the Blue Economy sectors. Smart and innovative solution programs, such as sharing knowledge sessions with experts and representatives from AIS participating countries, plankton, 
which was a competition to raise awareness in reducing marine plastic debris. Impact Pitching, which connects startups, small and medium-sized enterprises, potential investors, and growth enablers to gain partnership, and Ending Plastic Pollution Innovation Challenge, which was a collaboration with Marine Plastic Debris Project from UNDP Indonesia to address marine plastic pollution in Southeast Asia. Many solutions to challenges that affect AIS participating countries in four main thematic areas and SDG 14 goals are produced through collaboration programs. These programs will explore opportunities through innovation and experiment that benefits on a local, regional, and international scale through sharing knowledge and experiences between AIS participating countries.